we're in 2 Peter chapter 2. Remember this, 2 Peter is not 1 Peter. <laughs> 1 Peter is all about being anchored to what God provides. I love that. That's where you start. Being anchored to what God provides. So 1 Peter gives you tremendous arguments regarding the security of your salvation, regarding the power of the word of God, and how God is with all those who are being abused and persecuted and outcast because 1 Peter is written to the diaspora, those that were literally rendered homeless, jobless, familyless because they had made a decision for Christ. 2 Peter is all about a combat faith. Now that you're in this world and you've been saved for, um, it'd be a minimum in Peter from 1 Peter to 2 Peter, about four years time, uh, two to four years time, now it's time to get into that understanding that this is not a sprint, this is an onward plodding until we go see Jesus, either by death or by the Lord's return. And that whole experience, Peter is speaking to us about a combat faith. And we have been methodically going through 2 Peter chapter 2, slowly by design. When I say design, I think it's God's design, because the Lord knows I have all of my notes and I intend every week to finish those notes, 11 pages of notes today, and um, it never happens. It just, why? Because there's important things going on that he wants, to, wants us to know about and how to exercise that combat faith. So I'm going to read the even-numbered verses, if you'll join with one another, uh, out of the New King James Version Bible, read the odd-numbered scriptures. If you don't have that version, just look to the screen. It'll be right there. And you know, we've been looking at this little theme, actually, it's come out of this. What you really need to know regarding our combat faith is regarding those that are out there. About those that are out there. Who's out there that are hostile toward your faith? Peter's going to tell us those who want to rob us of our faith and those of us that are out, those who are out there who want to rob us of our liberty that is in Christ. What does that even mean to have liberty in Christ? So 2 Peter chapter 2, I'll begin verse 10, and um, we'll read all the way through the whole context uh, so we have it clear. He says in verse 10, and especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of the uncleanness and despise authority, they are presumptuous. He's speaking about false prophets, false teachers, false pul pulpits. They are self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. Verse 12, but these, like brute beasts, made to be caught and destroyed, speak evil of things they do not understand, and will utterly perish in their own corruption. Have, verse 14, having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls, they have a heart trained in covetous practices and are accursed children. But he was rebuked for his iniquity. A dumb donkey, speaking with a man's voice, restrained the madness of the prophet. Wow. Verse 18. For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. Verse 20, for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. Mm -hmm. 
we'll end here. But it has been, but it has happened to them according to the true proverb: a dog returns to his own vomit, and a sow, having been washed, to her wallowing in the mire. Father, we um, we open up to this portion of scripture, and we know that out of these last several weeks, you've been showing us, Lord, the the perils and the dangers of these last days in which we live in. And part of that, Lord, in our hearts, who know you, who know the Bible, we kind of um, take comfort knowing that all of this spiritual deception and all of this stuff that's going on in the world around us is actually a harbinger of your near return. That's our hope. But also to the fact, Lord, we pray that at a time like this, truth may go out, quite frankly, Lord, turbocharged, And Lord, that it may rescue people that are open and willing to receive from you your truth. So Father, we invite you by the power of your Holy Spirit to be at home here, reign here. Lord, be our teacher this morning, we pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Amen. You can be seated. Second Peter, Peter opens up in this book and he's introducing his audience that has been now dispersed. It's amazing the region by which this letter was to be sent. Now, don't think for a moment that Peter wrote this letter and um, they all had to just wait around until it made its circuit. Peter wrote the letter and then there were copies made and it was distributed and sent out. In fact, as we sit here today, the most, listen, the most documented record of any writings in all of antiquity. There is nothing that comes close to the Bible. Did you know that? There are over 13,000, nearly 14,000 manuscripts of the scripture. I think the only thing that comes close out of the almost 14,000 manuscript uh, evidences in manuscripts is uh, Homer's Iliad, I think has 613. Something like that. The Bible. Authoritative, the Bible, clear, direct. The Bible, you don't have to worry about believing in God and science. Don't ever think you have to decide between the two. In fact, when you look at the Bible and when you look at science, the authoritative power of the Bible, the Bible tells us that the same God who wrote the Bible is the same God who invented science. So you need to remember that, students in school. You've got to combat faith, friends. You have to tiptoe around. This book is alive, it's living, it's powerful than any two-edged sword. The only way that you'll know that that's true is if you actually put it to use. And that's what Peter was all about. And in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter introduced himself by saying, Simon Peter, it's me, Simon. (laughs) He says that he's a bondservant, you ought to circle that word, bondservant, an apostle of Jesus Christ. To those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Listen. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. Listen to this, verse 4, by which you, or by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. This is awesome. Having escaped the corruption of this world through lust, Peter goes on to introduce. So as we look at this today, everything that we're going to look at this morning is rooted in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Peter talks about his experience. He's talking about his reality. He's talking about the power. He's talking about his confidence. And he's saying, this is who we are in Christ. This is who we are as believers. Based upon the death of Jesus Christ, based upon the authority of the Bible, based upon the fact that God transforms human beings. I think by now, if you've been coming to this church for any period of time, the last thing that we want to do here is to do church on a Sunday morning, and that's it. We are only here now because we have discovered that the Bible is what refuels and re-energizes us so that we might get right back out into the world that's before us, that we might live out this active faith. 
Church is for you and I to be refilled, replenished, strengthened, encouraged. And Peter today is continuing on in this warning to us about false ministries, false pulpits, and even false gospels. Without the Holy Spirit, there is no way that you and I can experience this salvation life that is our foundational beginning. Before Peter even gets into the militant actions of the faith, when I say militant, I mean evangelism, discipleship making, confronting the culture with light and life. He lays the foundation of the security of the believer. And we need to hear this. It's no stranger to you, but in John chapter 14, I love this. I love this. John 14, Jesus is getting ready to leave earth. He's going back home. To heaven. And in John chapter 14, he's talking to the disciples, and, and in verse 16 through 18, listen to this. And by the way, as I read this, I need to ask you, is this true in your life? In John 14, verse 16, Jesus says, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, another comforter, some of your Bibles translate. The word is parakletos. Uh, kletos is to comfort. Para is to come alongside. Jesus is saying, I'm going to send to you another comfort that's going to be alongside you to be with you. And he says that he may abide with you forever. Notice, church, at the scripture, he says, I'm going to pray to the Father. Watch. The Father is going to give you another comforter. And the intent is that he will abide with you forever. Verse 17. He tells us who he is. He's the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him. They can't, the world cannot discern the Holy Spirit's work or presence. It neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit is key. Listen, friends, listen. Before I finish this verse, you're not going to heaven Unless that statement by Jesus is true in your life. For you to get to heaven, you've got to have, so to speak, a ticket. You've got to have a mark. You've got to have a a token. You've got to have a pass. Right? What is that pass? It's the Holy Spirit. He'll be in you. And then this, this, to me, blows it up. Verse 18. I will not leave you orphaned. I will come to you. By the way, in those few verses is the trinity of God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said, if I don't leave, it's not good for you. I've got to go. But when I go, I will send the Holy Spirit to you, the believer. Oh, yeah. And if the Holy Spirit's with you, he says, I will not leave you orphaned. I'll come to you. Today, Jesus Christ lives in your life by virtue of the fact of the Holy Spirit indwelling the life of every true believer. And that's the question today. For us to make sure that we're not deceived by these false teachers, these charlatans, these ones who are out to beguile people, who teach liberty, but in fact it's actual bondage, who go about uh, conducting themselves one way on TV or one way in front of people, but they live a lewd and corrupt life in secret. The deceivers... How are you going to know? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will use the word of God. One more verse before we get going. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 to 5. We all need this. The Bible says, know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. I want to submit to you today, we're living in those days right now. Everything that's going on around us indicates to me that we're living in those days. These are the latter days. By the way, the word perilous times, uh, it, it's, it's the word that means to just ever so slowly shave down a log into a toothpick until it's not even a toothpick. Do you feel like that? Don't you feel like the world is just grinding on you? I hear people say all the time, I get it, I understand the emotion. It's just that God's not telling me to do this, but people tell me all the time, I can't take it here, I'm moving. And by the way, there are more people moving out of California than all of the other 50 states. 
California, there's, a, there's, there's the great departure. The, the only bummer is I wish we could send all the bad people away and all the good people st- say. But that's okay. God knows what he's doing. Here's the deal. I get that. The reason why you feel that way is because the perilous times are wearing you down. But God may be calling you to stand. And so the Bible tells us there that these perilous times will come. Verse 2, men will be uh, lovers of themselves. Is that true or false? You see that on TV? Lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers. Blasphemers. Did you see the latest blas- blasphemer now on CNN? Did you hear what he said? Don, Don, Lem- Don Lemon. Don Lemon. You know who Don Lemon is? He says Jesus, was, Jesus, Jesus wasn't perfect. Jesus sinned. Where did he get that from? That's blasphemy. No, the Bible says Jesus is God and he's sinless. And uh, by the way, he's the only one that's ever been sinless. That didn't make him God. He was God before he came. If you want to be sinless, that's how you're going to have to pull it off too. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to be God to come on down and, and do it. There's only one, and it's Jesus Christ. But anyway, blasphemers, uh, disobedient to parents, glad that's not going on these days. Unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, my goodness, slanders without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And if you think that's enough, it gets worse. This is the worst of the worst. Verse 5, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. The power of godliness is the cross. The power of godliness is the empty tomb. The resurrected Christ. They deny that. All the cults around the world deny that. Did you know that? They all deny it. There'll be those that will have all of these appetites, either externally or internally. They have them. But verse 5 tells us that they live and act in the trappings of looking religious, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And then the Bible's very subtle. It says, from such people turn away. The word means run from them. That's the command of scripture. Run from them. God has a plan. Church, very quickly, we're going to run over where we've been. This whole segment, we're talking about You and I knowing about who's out there in our day, in our life, and how are we going to navigate these waters? Remember, verses 10 to 14 warned us that those that are deceivers are proud. The first genesis of their actions is rooted in pride. They're proud. It's all about them. It's all about their name. It's all about their place. Constantly elevating themselves. And we saw three things about that. They will prove to be authoritarian, verse 10. They will be without feeling. They'll have no empathy. They have no feeling. It's almost like they're serial killers. And maybe they are when it comes to the soul of a man or a woman. They're deceivers. They're without feeling, authoritative. And then we saw in verses 11 to 14 last time that they're given over. God gives them up to their vile passions, the Bible says. We're living in those days. In technicolor, I might add, Last week we saw the argument, second argument, verses 15 to 16, and it's the fact that they are those who are forsaken. Tragic, isn't it? Verse 15, we learn that they're deceived. They're not only deceived, but they deceive them of those that are around them. We saw also that they're compromised. They are deceived, they're compromised. And in verse 16, we learn that they are in fact judged. The Bible warns and tells us that these who go about to deceive you. Remember, maybe you're here today and you're not a Christian. You say, what's the big deal, man? Read a lot of heavy stuff already. I I thought the Bible was just like a bunch of sweet stuff. Hey, this is sweet stuff. Here's the sweet stuff. This is God watching out for your soul. I mean, think about it. Think about if if somebody insults your kid. You know, what if some some adult takes a swing at your kid? What are you going to do? Pray about it? The Bible says if you do not provide for your home, you're worse than a non-believer. If, some, if somebody tries to steal your kid, what do you do? Well, I'm going to just leave that in the hands of the Lord. <laughs> no, man, 
you turn into a mama bear in an instant. Listen, Peter here is being led by the Holy Spirit to announce and to declare that God takes your soul seriously, and if some false prophet or some false ministry comes along to try to steal you away, God takes that eternally serious, which leads us to today's argument, verses 17 to 19, that those that are out there that are dangerous to us is the fact that they are destructive. Write that down. They are destructive, these false leaders. And we're going to see just how in a moment. Verse 17 tells us, number one, that they are wells without water. Wells without water. They are incapable of refreshment. They do not give out. Now, people, listen, these are people cloaked in ministry trappings. They may not believe in God at all. Or they could believe in God, but it's not a biblical definition of God. They may be, listen, very spiritual, but not true. And the Bible warns us right from the beginning, and listen, all of you, we all, each of us need to judge those that influence us in our lives. The Bible warns right here, they are wells without water. What a remarkable statement. It's pretty graphic, isn't it? By the way, at the time of this writing in the first century, which had been, on, been like this for millennia beforehand, when you see a well, you know what we're talking about, a well? You know, we live in the 21st century. What's a well? The well, when you go to your kitchen, you turn it on. That's what we think a well is. But when you see a well, number one, it implies that you're in a dry place, and it implies that you're thirsty. That's why you'd care about a well. Oh, look, there's a well. What do you care unless you're thirsty? Hard for us to, to relate to this. Imagine if we were all in Death Valley today, where it's going to be 117 today. Imagine we all go to Death Valley. And um, we get out, we have a little, you know, we have a little water. And, and we're going to walk 20 miles. Hey, listen, when your, water, when your water is done, if up ahead you could see what looks like a well, would you get excited? Absolutely. In fact, when you, you see that well and your step even picks up, oh boy. Let's go. Hurry up, pick it up. There's a well. And you get to that well, and you know, we've all done this, right? There's nothing worse, especially when you're a kid. You get a rock, you hang over the hole of the well, and you drop it. And what do you do? You listen. And when it goes, that's not a happy sound. What do you want to hear? Splash. You want to hear water? The Bible says false prophets, false teachers, false ministries, they got all the looks, they've got all the things that can spin the emotion into action and get you going for 60 minutes. Now there's nothing to them. They cannot refresh you. Our world today is covered with people who have been inoculated against the true gospel and inoculated against true spirituality. They've been given something of an injection in some religious experience, but they were never given any life-giving water. They went to wells that had no water. And you hang around a well like that, and you begin to think that this is a definition of a well. It has nothing in it but a sandy bottom, and I can get nothing from it. And the danger that Peter's been warning, and think about it, God's been warning us for 2,000 years. Ministry, there's ministry that kills people because it offers them nothing that can give life. We send probes out into space looking for water with hopes that there'll be life. Are they not looking for a well? If you think about it, we found a teaspoon of water on Mars. What are you so excited about? There could be life. What about your soul on the inside of you? Are you refreshed? Is that helper, the Holy Spirit, who was alongside, is he in you now? By the way, a little bit of a tip. I'm going to ask you at the end of this regarding the Holy Spirit's presence in your life. And uh, if he's in you, you don't have to guess. <laughs> You'll know. And he will make himself known. But there are wells without water. Jesus warned of the Pharisees. Remember that? The disciples, Jesus was speaking, and he said, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Remember, he's warning them. Beware of the false doctrine of the Pharisees. And the, and the disciples 
It's so cute. You read it in the Gospels, and the disciples hear Jesus say that, and then it says that they began to say among themselves, we should have brought bread. <laughs> Jesus is teaching the Pharisees. They lead people astray. Woe unto them. They're terrible. They're all religious. They look amazing, but inside their life is full of dead men's bones. So beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And Peter goes, James, I told you you should have gotten a couple of loaves of bread last night. And Jesus has to tell them, I'm not talking about bread. He does. I'm not talking about bread. I'm talking about the Pharisees' doctrine. The Pharisees lead everybody into legal bondage. They use the law of God to wrap people up and keep them bound. So wait a minute, Jack. I thought the Bible says the law is good. Oh, no, no. The law is beyond good. The law is perfect. The Ten Commandments are perfect. I don't think anyone uses the Ten Commandments more effectively than our friend Ray Comfort. Ray Comfort can walk up to anybody and ask them, Hi, what's your name? My name's Bob. So, Bob, uh, do you think you're a liar? No. Well, let's look at the Ten Commandments. Okay. And the next thing you know, Bob's on his face crying out to God and asking for <laughs> salvation. Why? Because listen, everybody, God gave the law, the Ten Commandments, to show us our sin. When Jesus warns us, watch out for the leaven, the doctrine of the Pharisees, they were teaching, hey, get circumcised, do these rules and regulations, keep the law of Moses, and you'll make it to heaven. The only problem is nobody can do that. Jesus said, they lay that burden on you and they don't even pull it themselves. False teaching, false doctrine. There's the church of legalism. You do these things, you do those things, you reach this standard and you'll get a certificate and you can be a member of this church. There are the cults, all of them rooted, not in grace and peace. Not in God's mercy, all rooted in good works. There's probably never been more of an error in spiritual matters than for the cart to be in front of the horse when it comes to this issue of good works. Every born-again believer who's got the Spirit of God, of course, dwelling in them, good works will naturally come out of them because that's the Holy Spirit's work in you. You don't do it. Oh, come on, let's get up. It's Monday. We've got to go do good works. For what? So God will smile on me today. Stay in bed. It doesn't work that way. By the works of the law, the Bible says, shall no flesh be justified in the sight of God. It's faith in him. Not a Sunday hour and a half faith, but a faith that's every day. Every day of the week. And the legalist will say something like, you need to keep the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments cannot be kept. You say, how dare you say that? Oh, it's simple to say it. God gives it to Moses, Exodus chapter 20, and God says, these are the Ten Commandments. Anybody who breaks these, they die. <laughs> However, Moses, in the day that someone breaks these, go get this animal, innocent, unspotted sacrifice, get its blood, Come back to me, and we'll apply the blood of innocence, and they'll be forgiven. You're going to sit here today, and you're going to preach some legalistic gospel, like when Paul the Apostle was preaching to the churches in Galatia, and they came along, and they tried to undermine the grace of God when they said, you know what? You can be born again. You just have to be circumcised. Listen, legalism always hurts, <laughs> if you know what I mean. It, le it leaves you wounded. Legalism always wounds you. No one ever goes, whoa, awesome. Oh, what's up? I'm so legalistic. It is so cool. It's fantastic. They can't do that because they never even sense that in their lives because there's always a load. And there are so-called Christians walking around today that are either so-called Christians or they're Christians that are wrapped up in false doctrine. Follow me. I'm a Christian. It's so awesome to be a Christian. Come on, let's go. It's fantastic. The joy of the Lord will be your strength. What's wrong with you? I'm bound in legalism. That's destructive. They can never refresh you. Always do's, don'ts, rules, 
regula- never the love of God, which, listen, truly transforms. You say, well, I believe in God. But has it transformed you, this love that you have for God? It's very important. But they're wells without water. What a great disappointment. How do, how do we combat that? In 2 Timothy 3.16, one of the great verses of the Bible, 2 Timothy 3.16, It says, what does it say? What's the first two words? All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And watch this. It is profitable for, number one, doctrine. Number two, reproof. Three, correction. Four, instruction. For what reason? All in righteousness. All in the area of doing the right thing in life. This verse alone, I'm convinced this verse alone Once that you're a Christian, if we focused on that verse alone all of our lives, we would do well. The Bible is the answer. That's what that scripture is saying. Everything that you need to know about how to live your Christian life in the 21st century is tied up in that verse. You know what that verse means? By the way, this is the criteria. For those of you that are church shopping or church, I don't know what you call it. You know, you're going from, you're strutting. Hopping. No, no, I mean, you're actually, hop, I Forget hopping. That's bad. Don't hop. If you're church seeking, church shopping, hopping, hopping means you just keep, you just like a bee on a flower. Who, who needs that? That's great. You'll never grow, by the way, if you're a hopper. You won't grow. If, find a church. This is the criteria. You are mandated. How many of your Christians raise your hands? Okay, so you're mandated right here. All right, so honey, sweetheart, let's go look for a church. Okay, what are we looking for? Well, we need to look for a church where all scripture is present. The full counsel of God, okay? We need a church that is going to teach us. That's what doctrine is. Reproof means that it's, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of like a correction, but it's um, speaking into your life by way of, hey, come on, let's do it. Where it's a, you know, kind of a, uh, kind of a, you know? Uh, correction is exactly what it means. Jack, you know that's not me. You did that. Repent of it and don't do it again. Yes, Lord. He corrects. He shows you the right way. Instruction. What's the will of God for my life? All of this culminates in a simple meaning to a big word. Righteousness. Righteousness, friends, is not attaining some spiritual status. Righteousness is taking what you know and doing it. It's called doing the right thing. Just do it. Just do it. God will bless that. But the law points us to a righteous, holy God. When used rightly, That law should communicate to us that we cannot live up to God's requirements. In the moment you cast your face down on the ground and utter sheer terror and hopelessness, saying things like, who then can be saved? Then the gospel of Christ comes in. The word gospel is good news, and it just scoops you up. And the gospel of Christ sets you on your feet, and that gospel is that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. I know there's a big group here at second service and I've said it once before I'm going to say it probably many times before I die we have a tendency to look at things in groups did you get a group did you get a group on for that did you get or did you get uh, how many can we listen when it comes to salvation he died for all the world but we're tempted to have that generic it cannot be generic for you it has to be specific for you He is your savior. Listen, we know this is true because sometimes in our lives we can see when we get our eyes off the power of his promises, we can see ourselves as being the only one that cannot be saved or redeemed or forgiven. You know what I'm talking about? We have that feeling about us. Well, I know God loves you, but I'm talking about me right now. And we, listen, we're funny people. Uh, the, The one original thought I've ever had in my life. I don't think I've had any other ones but this one. In fact, I said it one time and it wound up, you can Google it, it's a quote, but not now because you're paying attention. <laughs> but uh, I, I said, and it was picked up by uh, Brainy Quotes or Goodreads or whatever it says, and never underestimate a man's ability to justify himself. 
That's true as the pendulum swings over here. Never underestimate a man's ability to justify himself. He'll go to great lengths. Or the pendulum swings all the way over here and we so condemn ourselves that we are absolutely without hope. And both are gross lies. The answer is Jesus. You find yourself on one side of any one of those two options, the answer is still Jesus. But the gospel comes in and saves. And it shouldn't be a surprise. We want to stand strong against those that are leading so many people astray. I heard it again this week, on Tuesday, that according to a certain group in Los Angeles, if I'm not baptized in their water, I cannot go to heaven. Watch out for stuff like that. This is nothing new, the gospel of God redeeming us from the holy, righteous standards of the law. Jeremiah 31, 31 starts right there. Love this. Jeremiah 31, 31. God speaks to Jeremiah, Old Testament book, nearly 3,000 years ago. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. Hey, Jewish friends, listen up. What's the old covenant? The Old Testament, the law. Jeremiah, your prophet, is saying that thus says the Lord, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Verse 32, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers. And if you have some doubt, he's going to tell you what that is. In the day that I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke... Remember that? Remember Moses is coming down the mountain carrying the Ten Commandments in stone. God wrote, God wrote them. Moses walking down. I wonder how big they are. Don't you wonder how big they are? Were they like a little thing? I, for some, he walked down the mountain with them. So it's like Moses buff <laughs> and strong. Was it supernatural that Moses carried them? I don't think so. I always wonder, I've always wondered what, how big they were. But it has nothing to do with our Bible study. I was just wondering that. So Moses comes down the mountain. And poor Joshua, he's been waiting there at the base of the mountain for 40 days. What a guy. He's not with Moses, and he's not with the people. He's all by himself. And the mountain's shaking, and he sees it, trembles. Joshua's standing there. Moses comes down, and Joshua goes, the people are rejoicing. Here? And Moses go. Moses says, they're not rejoicing. They're partying. And Come on. And they went, and the people were... Is not, not, it was not good. And Moses, boom. They didn't even get to, he didn't even get to say the first one. No, he said nothing, nothing. Oh, what? Oh, man. Before they even heard it. But there's a great story in that. There's a great meaning in that. They broke. Right here in Jeremiah, it tells us that they broke. They broke them. Though I was a husband to them, says the Lord, verse 33, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. Now watch this, because throughout the Bible, this appears and applies to Israel and Gentiles. It's universal. I will put my law in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God. They shall be my people. That's the born-again experience. Jesus said, I'm going to send the Spirit of God, remember, and he will be in you. The mark of the believer is not an external Ten Commandments. The mark of the believer is the internal truth of God welded to you. It's placed in you. God does that. It's called salvation. You don't conjure it up. You don't try to do it and because it's the thing to do. He does it. Sovereignly does it in your life. He takes over. And he shows you that you're not only his, but he turns you around and he sends you, as it were, down the mountain to a lost world. Cool thing is, the law of God is in your heart now. And you want to fulfill it. You want to live it. When you break it, you go straight to Christ and you say, Lord, I shouldn't have thought that. I shouldn't have done that. That's the amazing thing. The Ten Commandments could only be broken once you committed the crime. But the law of God can be broken in the heart and in the mind, never even lived out. That's good news, people, because that's how personal our God is. 
But that's only true for the believer. See, the, the cults and the false prophets and the false pulpits, they'll never teach this. Constant dependence upon them. Constant dependence upon our movement or our denomination or our thing. Watch out. And we could go on and on, by the way. Ezekiel 36, 26 echoes the same thing about having a new heart. Look at that. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Remarkable. Awesome. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12 says, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and into their minds, and I will write them. Then he adds in verse 17, Their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. But what about legalism? Listen, don't anybody leave yet. Ushers, just lock the doors. This is so important. After I give you this verse, you can leave, but not before. If today you are saying to yourself, I'm okay. Okay, I want to ask you, why are you okay? First of all, I never heard of a, a, a believer who knows Jesus to say regarding their soul, I'm okay. Did you hear? Listen. I've never talked to a real true believer who says regarding their soul, oh, I'm okay. Now, you may be struggling with your walk. Sure, of course. But don't we sing, it is well, it is well, it is well with my soul? That's the foundation today is the true gospel generates a real peace in your heart. Do you understand what's going on in the world? No. Nope. Mask, no mask. Uh, job, no job. Socialism, communism, republic, I don't know. It's all, it's all messed up. It's all crazy. You know what that causes me to do? Fight for what's right, but at the same time, I'm looking up. Amen. I'm looking up. Yeah. Lord, come on. Lord, please come. Lord, come today. Jesus, come for us today. See, well, I'm not ready yet. Well, you get ready. Get ready right now. <laughs> you need to get ready. I don't know what the direction our nation's going to go. Only God knows that. But at the end of the day, I lay my head down at night knowing that I'm safe in the everlasting arms of the Lord. And I hope you can do the same. It's what he's promised. So here's the big deal. Have you ever bumped into people or maybe you are this person and you say, I'm, I'm going to heaven. You say, well, how's that? Fantastic. Well, how? I was baptized. <laughs> I'm going to heaven. How's that? Oh, I gave money to the church. <laughs> How about this one? Wow. I'm going to heaven. I'm really good. <laughs> Imagine how many good people are in hell. The Bible makes it very clear. You'll never get to heaven by being good. Wow. So what are you leaving me with here? You're not leaving me with much. That's the point. We ain't got nothing. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You're not going to get that from a cult unless they lead you to the answer that they've crafted, which is total dependence upon their group. Oh, you, yes, yes, you're a sinner, but we will absolve you here and now, and we'll do this, and we'll do this special thing to you, this <laughs> thing. But listen, so-called... Christian denominations can spin the same thing. In Galatians 4, verse 27, it says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ were, uh, have put on Christ. And there are people who actually teach that means water. It has nothing to do with water. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Isn't that great? Remember a moment ago, God said in Jeremiah, I'm going to make this covenant with the house of Israel. And we all went, oh, I'm not a Jew. Well, that's okay. The Bible says that the gospel had to go to the Jew first. 
before it could go to the Gentile. Isn't that great? God looks at the cross. He looks at his son, Jesus. He looks at the empty tomb. And God has no bearing on the fact that if you're a Gentile or a Jew, you all must come the same way. I don't know why this is a a debate today in religious circles. How was a Jew saved? These people have conferences on this question. Well, let's talk about this. We know that the Bible says this, but how does a Jew get saved? Excuse me. The first way we ever heard about how that happens is in John chapter 3. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe on him would not perish but have everlasting life. Right? Who did he say it to? No, not everybody. Sort of. Wait. You're good, but just your minute too soon. He said it to a Jew. Nicodemus. How's a Jew saved? Jesus said it 2,000 years ago. End of story. Conference over. I'm dead serious. Jesus said it to Nicodemus. Was Nicodemus a good man? Good man. Did he tie the bunch? He tied the bunch. Did he know all the rules and regulations? Did he keep them? Yes, he did. Jesus said, you're not making it unless you're born again. Born again, the word means born from above. Did you know that? It means to be born a second time, but the birth comes from above, to be born from above. You say, why did it? But it does say in John 3 that it's through water and spirit. No, it doesn't. Jesus says, you were born once through water. Through water. Every one of us came the same way. Water, the water broke, the baby came. You're not coming out without the water. Your first birth into this world was water. It's not water baptism. You cannot get saved getting wet. The second, he's talking about birth. In fact, he goes on to John chapter 3 and he tells you that the things of the flesh, the water, that's of the flesh of this world. He said, I'm talking about the things of the spirit, which is from above. You've got to be born a second time. At your age, you need to experience a spiritual birth. But I've been going to church all my life. Doesn't matter. You need to be born again. How will you stay clear of the false prophets and teachers and ministries that Peter's warning us about? You've got to have the truth. And he is the way, the truth, and the life. And he said, I'll be in you. Remember, he said, I won't leave you orphaned. I'm going to be in you. And he does that by the sealing of the Holy Spirit, the the mark. You guys remember when we were little? Um, Well, I mean, if you're old, duh. I used to go nuts. I used to dive into my mom, the grocery bags, to get one of two things. Blue chip stamps or green chips. Green, remember the green chip, blue chip? Anybody, please raise your hand if you remember that. Okay? Whew. And yet, remember the books? You have a sponge. <laughs> Just seal those babies up. Why, why would you do that? This, you, take your, you take all those things that apparently seemingly look Worthless. You go down to the redemption store. That's what it was called. That one, Huntington Beach, redemption store. And you walk in there, it's so cool, because I remember, I had so much faith. Seriously, I'd walk, I had that thing, I'd, I knew every page was covered. With, I'd walk in there, boom. Want that right there. That one. I thought, this is an awesome country. (laughs) I didn't realize my my mom and dad were paying the bill. I got the stamps. I thought I got that Tonka truck for free. Somebody had to pay the price. Somebody paid the, nothing, listen. Salvation's not free, it costs God everything, and it's not cheap. It cost him the price of his son's dear life. He offers it to us. In that, the law is satisfied in Christ Jesus. See, Jesus satisfied the law. See, the law has no empathy, has no feeling. The Ten Commandments just looks at you. But I'm sorry. Right? So then when you fall on your face before the Ten Commandments and you cry out to Jesus, he's the one that comes in. There is, I was was in a church in Salt Lake City years ago 
And on the wall, they had a mural that they had lifted from uh, one of the great re reformers' commentaries. And there was this wretched, terrified sinner. It was all in black and white pencil. There was this wretched, terrified sinner like this. His eyes were wide open, and he's like this, scared. And Jesus is standing over him. And Jesus is holding up his hand like this, covering the sinner. And Moses has got the Ten Commandments coming down on the sinner. There's fire in Moses' eyes, the law. And Jesus takes it. That's why Jesus had to die. He lived and fulfilled the law, but because I am a sinner, someone had to die. And it couldn't be me because my death would have been worthless. But I was condemned to death, but Christ came to save. That's, um, we have, we're out of time. Um, I could keep going, but then I wouldn't even understand what I'm talking about if I kept going. But um, listen, how do you know? You read about all of these conniving, manipulative wolves in the last days. And they're out there right now. Listen, watch out. They're out there right now in numbers more than ever. I firmly believe that we are... I, mean, I don't want to get too weird on this. But we're living in an age right now it seems like in the last six, seven, eight months, something happened. I don't know if somebody like unlocked a gate in hell somewhere or left the door open. <laughs> but have you noticed? Here's a weird thing. You, the people you talk to, I talk to these people too. You say, what? Everything's great, man. Things are great. Where have you been? <laughs> no, something's wrong. I say something's wrong. It's not wrong. It's just not good. As a believer, I, Jesus said there'd be days like this before he'd come back. So you look at the way that people are thinking. We think it's great that we should release prisoners <laughs> because they could get COVID in the prison. Seriously. Are you kidding? You know, I mean, I, I don't mean to upset you about this, but I mean, things just don't make sense. And I'm, 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 this may sound funny, but I'm dead serious about deception. We think deception is going to pull up in a car? Oh, no, no. Without the Holy Spirit, some, is, some of it's very obvious, some of it is, what? You got you to be careful. So you talk about this thing, the whole, the whole world is under the sway of fear right now. And some people, I don't know if they love it or what, but they'll beat you up. But listen, here's the thing. And I mentioned this recently, so if you heard this, um, you know, forgive me in advance, but um, if you've had the COVID test, they put a thing in the... They, it's like, oh, wait, don't let it... <laughs> wait. It's no small thing. What are you doing? We got to get it. That's my brain you're up against. <laughs> well, we, hang on. It's like three inches in there. What are you doing? We've got to see, we're going to test you. Does that make sense? Everybody's walking around wearing something because we could get it. But you got to go into my brain to get it? <laughs> Why don't I cough on a napkin and hand it to you? What is this? You say, well, you shouldn't talk like that. But that's how the enemy works. It, listen, if it's not this, it's going to be something else. Have you seen how we live in a world now where the Bible tells us there's a man going to come on the scene and he's going to tell people, you can't buy or sell anything. Oh, no. What do we do? Just take my mark. It's okay. You'll be able to buy milk and do your you know, fast pass on the road, you can get a pizza, you just have to have this number, and with that, I'm sorry, he's not, the Antichrist is not coming, the master of deception is not going to come and say, listen to me, I'm going to give you a mark, 
It's not gonna happen. It's not gonna happen. You can hear violins, and the Antichrist is gonna say something to the effect, you need the number. You're gonna need my number because of your own safety. You're gonna love, I mean, not you, none of us will be here. If you're not a Christian, I'm telling you, be careful. So listen, here's the deal. Imagine, listen, we have, I have seven seconds left, but I, knew, I mean that, listen, seven seconds left. What if, what if right now you started to feel a flutter in your heart and you started to get dizzy? Are you going to go to heaven? On what basis are you going to go to heaven? That you're kind of good? It's not good enough. That you've been attending church faithfully? Not good enough. That you've kept six of the Ten Commandments? Not good enough. You were baptized? Not good enough. Do you hear me? God will not let you in. God's looking for one thing. The same Passover in Egypt, he looked for blood. The true Passover today is he looks for blood. Is there blood accounted to be upon your life recorded in heaven? That's what God does. He looks. He looks at the ledger in heaven. Imagine if God were to right now supernaturally reveal the seating in this church at this second service to show us right now in real time who's covered in the blood. Well, how do you know? Because the person who's covered in the blood says, listen, naked I came into this world, naked I depart. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Jesus died for me. I couldn't save myself. I'm a sinner saved by the grace of God. Salvation is his gift, and he offered it, and I took it. And I'm washed in the blood of the Lamb. That's how you get in, trusting what he's done. So because time is out, listen, someday time is going to run out. Where will you be? Here's what we're going to do. I'm not going to play any games. We're going to pray. If you've never gone public with Jesus Christ, if you have never accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, if today you are really doubtful that if you died, you'd go to heaven or not, you're, you speculate on that. Remember, the Bible says these things have been written that you might know that you have eternal life. Do you? You are supposed to. So we're going to sing. I'm not going to sing. Someone's going to sing. They're going to sing out here. I don't want, listen, I know people want to get their car out of the parking lot before the other people, but we're locking the doors. Nobody moves for this reason. Don't interrupt anybody. There may be somebody near you that's making a decision. Don't, you pray, Christian. Don't move, pray. But if somebody starts to get up to come forward, you let them out. But today, I'm going to ask you today to seal the deal with God. Maybe even you've accepted Christ, but nobody knows. You need to make that public today. Maybe today you've realized, wow, if I died, I don't think I'd fare well. You need to come today. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and we're going to give you a Bible, and you're going to leave with a new life because he's for real. So let's sing this song, and I'm not going to play. Listen, I'm not, if I have to coach you into coming, okay, then anybody can coach you out. Be intellectually honest with yourself. If you're battling inside, oh, I should go, I don't know, maybe I should. That's the Holy Spirit in you having a fight. It's best to surrender. So without games, we'll play this song. Father, we ask in Jesus' name that your Holy Spirit would move. Convict those who you're drawing into your family. And Lord, we pray that there'd be a holy, awesome, divine separation right here, right now, from one birth to the next. Father, we praise you for the power of the cross. We thank you, Lord God, that though we are now 21 centuries removed from when you walked this earth to preach the gospel, your disciples took it to the ends of the earth. The witness of the cross for 2,000 years and the same effect every day all around the world. Place of hope, place of forgiveness, a place of restarting new life real life with you. Friends that are standing here right now, let this fall from your lips out loud, but let me qualify it. I'm going to recite, I'm going to give you a prayer to recite. And that's just about all I'm going to give you because let's be honest, this is not some kind of a rote thing. You need to take these words and individually, personally 
mean it. We all may be praying the same prayer, but you've got to own it. You're not going to go to heaven because of the person on the right or on the left. You're going to go to heaven because of Christ Jesus. And so as we, you pray, you talk to him. You're speaking to him. But let these words fall from your lips, please. Dear Lord, I come in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for sending your son to die in my place at the cross and to be buried and to be resurrected that my sins might be forgiven me. Today, almighty God, I receive your offer, your free gift of eternal life in the name of Jesus. You are now my Lord and Savior, and I give my life to you willingly. Thanks for watching the Real Life YouTube channel. We love bringing you content that will help you grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. You can subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss one single video or live stream, and you can share it with friends and family. If you'd like to support this ministry by helping us reach others, by taking the gospel and the teaching around the world, you can do so by clicking the Give Now button. So thanks again for watching, and God bless.